I will try to set the stage because we have people from very diverse backgrounds and hopefully now onward we are going to move on to a reasonably broad common agenda. And let me therefore try to begin about this thing. Uh, I'm almost tempted to respond to something that Bhupesh said, but I will hold it back and maybe when I'm wrapping up, you can remind me that I was to say something in response to what you said. Because otherwise we can get distracted. You see, this is one of the famous things called the curse of David G. That you are interested in so many things, you can do so many things that you don't remain focused. So let me come to the story of AI and we have a very interesting start with what Shashidhar said. To many people it appears that AI is something which has just started happening. It is not true. AI is pretty old, almost as old as me. Uh, the, and work has been going on in India in AI since a long time. So when I started computing and getting into computer, that is the year is about 1966, there were three tribes of people using computers then. There was one set of people who were like me and fellow engineers who used a language called Fortran for solving complex scientific and mathematical things. They were also used by economists for modeling, so you would have people from planning commission also and so on. And they used a language called Fortran, which was an IBM language, which is a shorthand for formula translated, which meant that if you have a large number of formulas, which were difficult to do by hand or even by manual calculators, you could use this language to do those calculations. So we, and the biggest computer that was available in India was at the TIFR in Bombay. And that was therefore a collection point of people from the Planning Commission, people from Thumba Space Center, people from ISC Bangalore, and so on and so forth, who were onto using computers. There's another tribe of people who came from the business sector, people with coats and ties and this thing. They were using it for what was called inventory, payroll, and such resource management. That was called common business oriented language called COBOL. The two things were very different because they didn't have too many equations, they simply had processing and addition, etc. etc. There's a third set of people who were almost underground who were using languages like Prolog and Lisp to do what is called artificial intelligence because it was basically about doing logical. So these were about calculations, that was about logic. Can computers follow logic? And can they be made to do logical steps one after another and so on? We also had institutions for that. In Bombay, there was an institution called National Center for Software Technology, which had a director, S. Ramadi, who was very well known and famous. And the DRDO had a center called <coughs> CARE, Center for Artificial Intelligence and Robotics, which had a Dr. Vidya Sagar as its director, who himself was a student of Raj Reddy from Carnegie Mellon University, very well known for robotics. But the rest of the environment was not very conducive for meaningful results. So how much robotics can you do with a 386 chip or a 486 chip or a Pentium chip? And that is why, while these people are all very knowledgeable, there wasn't much application. In the year 1956 already at a college conference in Dartmouth, some of the leading thinkers in AI had, in this field had proposed the term AI and they were very optimistic that within a few years we will have something which is really intelligent and useful compared competing with the Turing test and so on and so forth. But the journey was slow. This happens very often that initial people are very enthusiastic and then they realize that practical stuff is not coming out of it. And in 1970s, it is called the winter of AI, there was actually a formal report by Mr. Nighthill saying let us stop funding to this field because nothing is going to come out of it. And uh, that was a long time. And then there was a resurrection of AI. The resurrection of AI happened from what I would call not planned activity, <coughs> to certain things happening in different directions. The first was that all these children were playing video games on small devices, and people realized that these graphic processing chips are actually doing a lot of computation to make all that action happen so swiftly. And therefore, they realized that instead of our traditional computers, let us use graphic processing chips. That gave some stimulus and a revival of that. The other thing that gave revival to the AI was the extension of what Shashidhar talked about. When people were first looking at neural network as a model, 
they still had a very simple idea. Here is the initial thing. Here is the neuron. At that time, it was called the perceptron. We will put some mathematics into it, and we will get the answer. It turned out that this could do only a few very simple problems, which were almost those who understand where an analog computer would have done the job. You had a situation, you had a circuit which represented the situation, and you got an output. The big breakthrough came when people realized instead of trying to do it with a single perceptron, let us create a number of layers and divide the problem solving into a number of stages. So you had the initial layer which got the initial data, you had a final layer which presented the data, and in between you had a large number of hidden layers. And it seemed, and still today it seems, that having enough number of layers, you could probably solve any problem. Basically, you're saying is that you are decomposing the problem into a and at this stage you're looking at just one aspect of it. So typically, if you are looking at a facial recognition thing, you will say, is this a face at all? Is this a human face? Is it this and is the nose like this? Is the jaws like this? Is the spacing like this? Because uh, the morphology of human faces is well known. Lots of detectives, criminologists, forensics use that. They know what. So let us say there are 20 parameters which define your face. Instead of having one program that talks of all the 20 parameters and tries to solve it in one go, you start looking at each of these parameters in it. This became very important because this could then apply to any object recognition. Is it rectangular? Is it oval? Is it is circular? At each stage, you just go yes and no. So now you can have 30 different layers, but you would get the answer for most of these things. So today, for example, when you have driverless cars, the real problem in driverless cars is object recognition, image recognition, and so on and so forth. So this was the next thing. So it was called machine learning in general, and neural networks, deep learning, and neural networks in particular. It was called deep learning because it depended upon how many layers you could do it. But something else was still missing. As Shashi knows, you could create all this. You could train it with some data. There wasn't enough data available. So if you recall, <coughs> go back into the past. Maybe the <coughs> will be able to recall better. If you go back into when we were young, how many photographs did we have of ourselves? One with a graduation degree, one with a marriage, the couple, one with a group photograph of the marriage, and so on. So you wouldn't have more than four or five photographs in a lifetime of a person. So what will you train the thing with? You're giving them four photographs, then 12 years apart, completely <coughs> today with the internet. And so many images being available on the internet, it became possible to train this thing. So now, if you work in this field, there are various sources of images which you use and you can train them. There's a well-known set of data which is recognizing, say, alphabets. So it's a whole set of data in which A to Z and 0 to 9 are written in so many different ways that you can train your thing. So this is what happens. So for example, we were talking about chatbots and natural language processing. Some of you may recall that long years ago, if you wanted to do speech to text, you had to use a software called Dragons Naturally Speaking. It's fairly expensive software, had to be trained in your voice, could recognize only your voice, and it had to be trained by speaking all the 44 phonemes in the English language. So just like a typist types the quick brown fox jumps right over the lazy dog so that he has practice of all the letters A to Z, you have to train. And it would then only identify your phonemes. If I train my system, Bhupesh's voice would not be recognized on it. Today it is not so. On Siri, anybody speaks, it is able to identify. Maybe make a little bit mistake, but by and large is able to follow. So these are some of the things which led to the progress. And between 2014 and 2018, there have been tremendous jumps in this field. So much so that today, we use it and we are not even aware. So for example, Siri, Cortana, Alexa, all these are using natural language processing. And uh, the spam filter in your email is using that. When you get so many mails, it automatically filters a lot. So that is using, and there are so many things when you buy anything at Amazon. When you read a book on Kindle, when you read a book on Kindle, you are reading the book and the Kindle is reading you. They know exactly which part you skipped, which part you didn't study, where you were stuck, 
what you want to do, and so on. The whole field is now progressing at a galloping pace. What happens is that when progress happens in a number of dimensions, then the overall progress becomes very much faster. So why am I talking 2014 to 2018? Go back 100 years. What was happening between 1914 and 1918? The First World War. The entire world was just busy in a bloody fight where millions of people died, millions of people suffered, and actually the First World War came to an end 11th November 2018. And that, you see the difference. For four years, all of humanity was just fighting for some stupid things. It got repeated. 39 to 45, the Second World War. Now imagine children who were, who were born in 1900s or like that, about 100 years ago, and when they're teenagers, they're seeing the First World War. When they're 40 years of age, they're seeing the Second World War, their children are seeing the First World War. And the Second World War lasted again from 1939 to 1945, and finished with the explosion of the nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, August 6th and August 9th. See, we've had a tremendous period of peace for a very long time. And the only war we are seeing today are the China and US trade wars. It's not a real war of people really fighting. But why I'm trying to emphasize this is that we are seeing times of very rapid change and change in times of peace. Actually, in times of war, everything is dissipated. Great innovations also happen. Many innovations happen during time of war. But the total loss to humanity is a very different kind. Today, we are at a time when we have all these things, peaceful times, and therefore, very interesting things can happen for humanity. So what is it that AI does? Which many of you are from a technical background, so I really don't have to, uh, shouldn't have to spend much time. But I like to make the story clear. See, intelligence is something which cuts across large parts of our universe. The only things where we are sure that there is no intelligence, as you say, is called the mineral kingdom. The moment you come to the plant kingdom, there is evidence of intelligence. And there is significant plant intelligence, and it is mind-boggling. The complexity of the aromas and smells and chemical identification which plants can do will uh, be human vocabulary. So animals have intelligence, you all agree with that. In fact, even today, dogs are used for sniffing, smelling, much better than any human being or even an electronic machine. Finally, even today, a cross-border for drug peddlers, it is dogs which are coming and being used. There is no electronic equipment. Which, yesterday, I think dogs can predict that this person is having malaria. Did you read about that? So, so it's a very interesting thing. And then, of course, we humans also have intelligence. So when we start talking about artificial intelligence, the problem begins with, in terms of what we talk, and in the view of ourselves, it's basically that intelligence means being able to process more complex information, something which is not obvious and so on. So let me quickly say that uh, while we are all very grateful to God, actually God gave humans a very raw deal, very bad deal. Uh, look at our eyesight. It is nothing compared to the eyesight of so many other animals. Right? So, and they were existing there. So still he chose to give us a defective eyesight. Our hearing, dogs can hear ultrasound, infrasound, etc. He gave us the ears which are very low quality. If you look at the deliberate strategy, he wanted humans to be the weakest species on the planet. We can't run as fast, we can't fly, we can't swim. And he's given this to all others. Small fishes can swim, small birds can fly, small horses can run. We were given the weakest kind of thing. The only thing which I think he didn't really plan for was we had highly developed brains. And with those highly developed brains, we were able to overcome all these limitations. So I talked about spectacles. So if I can't see very well, I use physics, use concave lens, convex lens, variable focal length, and I can correct for myopetrism, hyperpetrism, astigmatism, everything. So God loses, we win. It, it, we can't fly, so we created, maybe only 100 years ago, but we created aeroplanes. And now you know the kind of distances we can go from London to Singapore, etc., etc. No bird can fly like that. So again, God loses. 
We've got submarines, nuclear submarines, and so on. The point is that the human brain, because of its development, is able to conquer most of the limitations in which we were kept in a natural environment. If you look at all animals, they have, can only survive in their natural habitat. You can't take a koala bear and bring him to equator and survive, but we can because we create air conditioning to suit ourselves. We create temperature control. Now we have to create air quality control. <laughs> if there is a lot of pollution, we use air quality control to survive. Computing actually augmented the human mind. So the traditional computing from 1980s, etc., and then it became personal. So actually computing started in the 50s, 60s. By 1980s, it became personal and everyone could have a computer. So what happened is the computer became an engine of the mind and therefore many of our natural limitations. So if I can't remember very much, I have it in the computer memory. Somebody was complaining we don't remember more than two telephone numbers. No need. It's there somewhere you can access it. You don't remember everything that was said, you can do that. So this is what gave rise to this first revolution, first computer revolution. And you've seen a big change. But the AI is a little different and is a fundamental step different. So, so far, everything that you have solved, you needed to know a method for solving it. So you needed to do an algorithm and you needed a programming language in which you would do that. The programming language is a change from the Fortran, COBOL, etc., to basic C++, and today Swift and Java and all kinds of stuff that has kept on changing. But algorithms and problem solving methods fundamentally are the same and there's a little bit on the threshold that is happening. But what we call artificial intelligence is where the computer system or in fact algorithm learns by itself. And this is the big threshold difference and I am sharing this in some length with you because I think many people don't understand that. They still think of AI as some more powerful computer. It necessarily need not be powerful. It's a difference that happens. And the difference that happens is that an algorithm can learn from experience. A traditional computing, it will repeat it. It may have done that calculation 2,000 times, but it will still do only that calculation and nothing more. But a learning algorithm can learn. And it's very interesting that the entire practice of teaching for thousands of years, nobody has cared to define what is learning. But a learning algorithm is well defined and one of the Famous books, and this is a book by Tom Mitchell on machine learning. So this is a standard book on machine learning by Tom Mitchell. Similarly, there's a very good book on deep learning by Joshua Benjiu and others. So Tom Mitchell in machine learning defines a learning algorithm on a given task with the performance measure P, and so that includes with experience E. So that's the definition. So you say, what is the task I do? So I have to define the task. You have to have a measure of the task. And then you say, here is a design intervention, and is my performance improving? So that is how you have basically supervised learning, which is where you're training this using this method. Unsupervised learning, where you're not training anything, but it is seeing anomalous patterns in it. And you also have sometimes called reinforcement learning, transfer learning, and so on. Machine learning and AI is basically about this field. So this is what it does. There is a search. You don't remember humans have always wanted a search for an idea. We, in alchemy, the search was for finding something which will convert base metals into precious metals and gold. We also had this elixir of life, something which will make us immortal. So the search in thing is what is called the master algorithm. Can we have one algorithm? You fit this, it was us. It's called a gender problem solver. We all want that. That we want a gender problem solver. No matter what the problem you feed into this, that is still far, far away. It's a holy grail. But today what you do is you try out various methods. So if you look at machine learning algorithm, broadly they are n types. A round figure could be 10. So one of them is simple linear regression, which you've been doing in your school lab test, you draw a straight line and try to fit. And then you realize sometimes straight line is not good enough. If things are moving very fast, then you need exponential, therefore you have a logarithmic fitting. Sometimes things are statistical, so you use Bayes' theorem. And so on and so forth. There are a number of machine learning algorithms. And so what these things do, they will look at the data, apply the thing, and then you have to interpret 
whether it is working, not working, how well it is working, and that is why they have coined this term called data scientist. Prior to coining of the term data scientist, scientists were classified as physicists, chemists, life scientists, biologists, zoologists, etc. The interesting part is that what physicists did was the same thing, they processed data looking at the physical parameters. So if it was not a parameter of physics, it was not a physicist thing, or of geology, geologist thing, or of chemistry. The data scientist says, I don't care. As far as the data is concerned, and you can put any attributes to it, which is called features, I can do all this, and then you decide whether the feature is meaningful, not meaningful, useful, not useful, what field you have created. So today, people are interested in what will people buy, how much will they buy, when will they buy. These are not physics parameters, but these are useful business parameters. So the business people use that data to find that. Take Airbnb and OYO room. Do you know that OYO room today already has a market capital which is more than that of Oberoi and Taj combined? And has no room of its own. Because it uses a machine learning algorithm to match the customer and the room. So basically what you're doing is, you're saying, each customer has a preference for a room or a requirement of a room. So when we go and live in many of these five-star hotels, we don't use any of those facilities, but you still pay the money. In the long run, it is no longer good. So what the OYO or Airbnb does, it says, let's say, what are the parameters of a room? So X1, X2, X3, XN, okay? What are my customers looking at? And then tries to optimize that for each customer. So you're no longer talking statistical average premium customer, business class customer. For each customer, you are doing that. And because you have computers, so actually the success of this is on machine learning. So let me now come to education aspect. Education today is in deep trouble. And uh, because many of you are from physics, Pauli had a very famous expression for things like, it is not even wrong. So when Pauli was irritated with something, he said, this is not even wrong. And what he meant by, you've not even understood what the problem to be solved is. Once you've understood what the problem is, then it can be right or wrong. But it's not even wrong because we're doing something because we used to do it. It's like, shadi vya mein nahi, ghodi mein chadke aar rahe hai. Kyun aar nahi pata? Aaj ki tarik mein sab kaar mein jabha ghodi chadhenge jabhu. That is what is happening to our education. Our education is in the ghodi chalna mode. For this thing, you know it has got nothing to do. And the real stuff you are not doing. So, but so, let us say what is, so what is an ideal system of education? An ideal system of education is where a learner is matched to the ideal teacher and is in constant engagement with that teacher. Nobody is debating that. Even uh, people like Benjamin Bloom says the best community education is one on to one by the right teacher, right students. So how do you do it? Everything that we do is wrong. Sometimes we have very bright students sitting <laughs> with a very dull teacher. Sometimes the teacher doesn't even know that, whatever. So I'm not getting into details. So I'm saying this is the ideal we are looking for. And therefore, it is personalized, contextualized instruction. How would I, AI help in that? AI. The expectation is, one is all routine administrative tasks which are done in an educational institution would be done by, it is already a lot of people are selling ERP solutions as such to school. You imagine an AI enabled solution, that is one part. And that is what I call level one of AI in education. Level two is what we are talking about today, chatbots in education. So once you have an agent with which you can speak and converse, you have a very good support system, and this can be 24 by 7 to you. So it can be a teacher, it can be an administrative support, it can be a career and guidance support, it can be uh, what do I do, it can be an emotional, psychological support, whatever is available to you 24 by 7. So the guru in all its manifestations is available to you at one level as separate chatbots, at another level integrated, where it just branches to whatever you need to do. So that is why to me chatbots are the most fundamental aspect of AI in education. And I call this level two of AI in education. Level three is the personalization. We mentioned to you about Amazon and Flipkart. So Amazon, what does it do from your previous purchases? 
it tells you what you are likely to do. And I am a great user of Amazon and uh, it's served me so well. Any book which is published around my area of interest, I have it in my doorstep within a couple of days. The first from my parameter, he will identify. I'll give you examples of three books I have. A book called Robot Proof Education by Joseph E. Aum, president of Northeastern University, would have never come to me had it not been for the AI kind of a thing. I have a book called The Fourth Educational Revolution, again by a vice chancellor of Buckingham University, which would have never come to me in any other way, my browsing at bookstores, etc. I have another book called Teaching in the Fourth Industrial Age. Again, it would have never come to me. I can go to anybody else. They have not even heard of it. And in the list of resources I've given, these are books at 5, 7, 11. They all came from, I was, somebody was telling me that, no, we are discussing this, this. And I told him, I have that book with me, which I would read that. So anyway, the point is, this is called contextualization of learning for a person. Yes? Professor, I'm sorry for this very stupid question, but There's no question is stupid. And you can't ask a stupid question. <laughs> How are, you, how are you getting these books when you're saying that uh, Amazon keeps on recommending me. So these are the Amazon recommendations? Yes, that's what I'm saying. And which uses AI. It uses a tool called Recommendation Engine. Both Amazon and Netflix use Recommendation Engine. The goals are different. Amazon is looking for what I will buy at what price point so that I'm tempted to buy. So it will not recommend me a book which is 5,000 rupees because it knows I buy books like 500, 700, etc. Netflix, on the other hand, is looking for the cheapest movie that you are happy with. So if you are very happy seeing Raj Kapoor, Char Sabis or something, they are very happy because the cost to them is very little and they are giving you a hamper uh, per monthly this thing. So this is the point that many other, Amazon is in fact, it is called, I think, obsession with personalization. So that is the way and education should be having the same. So what I'm saying at the level three, you will be given that content which is good for you. It is not because it is prescribed. It looks at your pattern, identifies. I said, look here, you're studying physics, but your interest seems to be in literature. And you really like this phrase somewhere, which was given in Julius Caesar. So you might like more of Shakespeare's play, etc. And it will quickly <coughs> analyze those responses. Sometimes we pick up one thing and generalize on that. But it will be able to look at all that and analyze and say, you have a fleeting interest in that, but your substantive interest is how can you be wicked? So it will start telling you things about being wicked rather than being nice. So that's the first. So this is the third level. Fourth level is on assessments. Our teaching system is so stupid. You learn something, but how do you know that you've learned it? In the exam. Exam happens. Somewhere else. By the time you get the marks, you don't even know there's marks for what. Now, all learning happens when the feedback is instant. If she asks a question, I respond, there is something. If she asks a question, I said, this will now go to Shastrati Bhavan, then it will go to PMO. From PMO, we will get a reply six months later. What feedback is it? So this is what is happening in the six. See, when you're playing cricket, you throw a ball, right now you're seeing and you know what the batsman is going to do to it and does it and so on, right? So you become a better player. And that's why children love playing games because the feedback is instant. In our case, you do an exam on March 15th, you get some result on June 20th and you don't even know what it is about. Because what is it that I answered which was right? What The feedback is completely meaningless. And they have absolutely no sense of shame in it. Sometimes you actually get promoted to the second semester and the previous semester exam results are not there. So why did you break them into semesters? How can you be in a second semester without you yourself knowing whether you are passing? So one of the things that AI said, and this Anthony Sheldon says this, Anthony Sheldon very, he's the vice chancellor of Buckingham University, he's also been a school leader. And he says that this examination system will go, nobody will wait for months and years to know whether he knew something or not. You will know it instantly like you know in a game. So you will get a chunk of learning. You want assessment, you will get some assessment. You will get the score and a feedback on what you have to do. So he says that this monolithic exam system, when this, and England, you know, makes a lot of money from the Cambridge exams. <laughs> so it isn't this thing. So this is the other thing. So you'll have uh, automatic assessment continuous and very fast. See, this is what is important. Learning 
the feedback has to be very fast. And this is how, for example, when we look at our human nervous system, you know that efferent nerves and efferent nerves. And, so suppose you touch something which is very hot and it takes you three minutes to get the response, you'll be burned by then. The nature makes sure that you get that instant response when you're touching something very hot or an electric current or something. Well, if you wait, and one of the theories is that the dinosaurs became extinct because their nerve propagation was so slow that when somebody cut off some part here, they didn't get to know until it was too late. So an efficient feedback is the fifth level is the level at which we are talking about the brain computer interface. There are already people who when you tell something, you will put a band around yourself. It will, see, the, uh, what you are doing in the brain can be three levels thing. One is uh, intrusive. So you actually, but this is done only with patients with injuries, where you actually implant certain things right inside their brain. The other is like what you do for ECG and EEG, there's something which is on top of it. And the third is going to be that you just wear a band. And people are working on this. And uh, we had at one time demonstrations that can actually, you know, see what you're saying, what you're doing, etc., etc. And uh, therefore, the fifth level will be where directly <laughs> you will be interacting with whatever you have to interact. So schools, institutions, etc. Yes. Uh, is that Ukraine project? There are a number of companies working yes. on that. See, there is there is one more different project called the Whole Brain Project, where you are doing that. It's a very interesting case. We have actually uh, a large number of neurons. When we are talking about this thing, we are simplifying. But you are actually saying, let us do the whole neuron map, like we did the genetic map of the DNA and uh, the GNA mapping. We are talking of the neuron mapping. They are also doing the whole cell map of it. So that neuron mapping, the whole brain is called whole brain, uh, whatever emulation. And there is a whole thing about the entire cells because brain is not the only thing. So I often tell people that, see, uh, in my brain, I sing very well. But my vocal cords don't obey me. <laughs> Lata Mangeshkar, they obey. That's the only difference. In my brain, my singing is no less than that of Mohammad Rafi or Kishore Kumar or anybody. But that wretched vocal cords are undisciplined. They don't listen to me and they don't work the way they should. <laughs> so this is what the whole thing is going to be about. So then once I can get them also to respond to that, I can do... But So you've already seen that nowadays people make, you know, uh, fake uh, speech and fake voice, etc. That will be happening. So once you understand, Today what happens is your vocal cords work in a different way from Bhupesh's or Rajiv Tyagi's or mine. But once we can control them through external pulses, it will happen. So that is the fifth level there. What I am trying to say is that the mission is, we talk about mission 2020, the mission is to get AI into education. And I am talking lifelong learning. I say I can begin with school, but continue throughout life. The age of leaving school will become earlier. Very few people will stay in school up to the age of 18. You see absolutely no point why you would stay in the school till age of 18, because most of the things that you need to learn will be done in the formative years, and we can talk more. It's like a plane, you know, how much time does a plane need on the runway before it can take off? A good plane should not take much time. So a good student should not take much time in just becoming an adult and learning on the side. So what are we trying to do? I am personally trying to work on this hopefully optimistic model of a two-year plan that by the end of 2020, we should have fully understood and adapted and adopted these things. Year 2019 is largely an awareness time. So we will start telling people, etc. So one is the topics that are happening, so you get informed about two, the things that you would use. But the thing that you would use is only four or five. Again, all of you are from a physics background. In the days of simple electrical circuits, if you had an inductance, a capacitance, and a resistance, you could define almost all kinds of circuits. Right. So all kinds of AI applications will consist of these four or five blocks. A recommendation engine, a prediction thing, a natural language processing, a whatever, whatever. So as fundamental, we said these are six, seven blocks. All language is what? Reading, writing, listening, speaking. So we will say what are the fundamental AI blocks? For each block, there will be many people who are providing solutions. So today, uh, Dr. Rajiv Tyagi will talk about IBM solution. Let 
Microsoft also has a solution. Google also has a solution. Amazon will have a solution. So then you will decide which solution. You are saying, what are the building blocks of transforming education? What are the various choices? I may say, I don't even want to do all that. I will just train Alexa with new skills. So I am a physics teacher, class 8. I will put all physics 8 curiosities into my Alexa skills and use Alexa. I don't have to do too much work. And I know all the things. And I can escalate that when the answer is not satisfactory to you, you can contact us. Like in a call center, you escalate it to a higher position, you escalate to a human being. So there are various ways which will emerge. And then we talked about the same thing about the brain-computer interface. So adaptive learning with brain-computer rather than this thing. So this is the direction that we are going. My other very big postulate was that in India, traditionally what happens, it happened in the past, I mentioned to you, there was a National Center for Software Technology. There was a CAIR, and there were these IITs and IISC. The temptation is to build a big institute of AI. And they wanted to build one. In IIT Bombay, they have sort of an Vadwani Institute or something, Niti Ayo, but this becomes just expenditure things of a sentiment. Oh, here is that great institute of AI. And you will realize that it will do whatever it does. I'm not decrying it. But the need is a massive education. The need is of a massive education. But the government is not interested in because there is serious dangers to them. If people become capable of thinking even more than what they can do today, it's an extreme danger for all democratic governments. Because they're quite but forget that. So what I'm looking at is what the mobile phone did to people. I want to talk about AI to that people. And I tell this to my IS friends, see you lost a big opportunity in mobile. One of them would have been Director General of Mobile Phone Training and Deputy Director General of Mobile Phone Training, Additional Director. iPhone Training would be a DDG. Android Training would be another DDG. And there would be one called AI Bhavan, like we have Electronics Niketan. In that Bhavan, you would all have to go Right. Today what has happened is, you may not know, but your phones are already equipped with AI chips if you have an iPhone 10, etc. And the Chinese have plans that anything, any phone which is more than 5,000 rupees tomorrow is likely to have an AI chip in it. What does it mean? It means that the computing is moving from cloud to edge. Cloud, see there is a transaction time. Your message goes to the cloud, it comes from the cloud, it comes back, takes time. Edge computing means it is processed there. So when you're doing, let us say, um, automation, transportation, you can't wait. The signal has gone. <laughs> it is right there. So you have to get it. You're also talking of 5G. People are talking 5G. In the rest of the world, 5G is coming from next year. In India also, my personal view is, and if you're not going to broadcast this, uh, Reliance will get all the license between now and March. Rollout may take another year. But in a year's time, Geo with 5G will be available. Enough, but it may not be everywhere, but enough places. So what are we talking of? A 5G AI society, what will education be about and what it is going to do? So the final point that I'm trying to say and I'll is that let's not wait for some other company like Educom or this or that to come and try to tell us what we should do. We are educators. And as we can see right here, every school has physics teachers, maths teachers, chemistry teachers, computing teachers, and also teachers in other subjects so that you can build. And they're all masters, and some of them are PhDs. Why do you want a BBA or a BCA from some so-called education training company to come and tell you what to do? And this is exactly the thing that I'm trying to do. So my agenda is to get five physics teachers, five math teachers, five computer teachers, five this thing, a group of about 30, 35, to work together broadly, first to understand, deliver both courses, I think. But China has created a course right from kindergarten to 12, and there's a huge agitation about it. But the reason there is agitation is, and there is perhaps a point, that you don't just treat AI to children, you have to let them develop. So what I am trying to say is that I am trying to create, with the help of these people, what you might call a preschool thing for the AI age. So you will learn AI when you are properly equipped for AI, but things like computational thinking can be taught to a lot of people. And we have at least uh, 
got Anupam Kaushik to take a lot of interest about teaching computational thinking at the school level. He even has written a book. Now, if you recall what the key things in computational thinking are, pattern recognition. What are we saying in machine learning? Pattern recognition, feature recognition, etc., etc. So you don't have to tell them to do this on this computer and solve at such a commercial level, but you can tell them this is the way you solve problems. And the idea of being able to solve problems in a general sense and then let the machines take care of all the details is what is very important. So China may not have done it rightly, but now if we have uh, educators at younger age, you decide. I'm not saying you force AI on everybody. You just say if you did this in an age of AI, how would you do this? And what more would you want because they already have those tools. So if you are uh, teaching history or geography or any such thing, what would you do? Instead of ignoring them and saying, this is devil's this thing and you should not have Google in the classroom or you should not have this, you say, what do we do? And as I think uh, Hupesh tried to say, most important thing that we are now going to do is to become more human. That will become the purpose of education. The, in our generation, the purpose of education was to be technically equipped. That gave the best rewards. Today, how good a human being are you going to be? And humans have huge qualities. So when I mentioned about the book called Robo Proof Education by Joseph Aoun, he has said, see, instead of being poor competitors to machines, let us be greater versions of ourselves. So what is that humans can do that machines can't? And we're not talking simple things about emotions, etc. That also can be done. So the Joseph Aoun has coined a term called humanics. So he says, just like for robots, we need to know robotics. For humans, we need to know humanics. So if I want to develop robots, maintain robots, I need robotics, I need humanics. So, uh, so this is the approach that we want to say. This is not a one-shot thing. See, the problem in the past has been, they said, you do this thing and then everything. Right? No, you have to do a number of things. I mentioned to you just one. There's another set of thing called blockchain. Now you can use blockchain for record keeping and that throws away all the gadgeted officer certification, etc. out of the window. So all the pieces are there. We have to see how we can transform it. And we are not into a revolution. We just want a sophisticated transformation. So things are like that. And I am saying this with confidence because I have seen the IIT as close quarters. I have a PhD from Roorkee which is now called an IIT. I taught in IIT Kanpur for 10 years and I was a member board of management of IIT Delhi for 6 years. IITs did not wage a war against existing. There was a new college before that. There was Roorkee, there was Gindi, there was ben uh, Banaras, there were so many colleges before. IITs did not. They just quietly did a better job so that others wanted to start copying the IIT model. IIT never said that you are bad, I am good, you are this, I am this. They did. So I am trying to say, can we get the spirit of what the IITs did in the 60s to transform India to what needs to be done today in the 2020s to transform India. And I am not looking at going upwards and going for policy makers and putting it and saying everybody must learn it. No. Those who can. And the whole idea of AI is that you can then get almost anybody because the whole track is personalized. Today the track is your age 14, you must do this. Your age 16, you must do this. No, I may not want to do it today. But I may want to do it when I'm 32 years of age. And we're saying that possibility still exists. So the story is pretty interesting. Uh, I hope many of you believe in this and are willing to be part of it. We also want this to have a hands-on component. So today is the first example of something like this, but then hopefully we will have somebody telling you how to make a recommendation engine, how to do a predictor algorithm, how to do feature extraction, whatever are the basic building blocks of AI. We will make sure that this is done, and this community will be a community which hopefully will take this forward. I could go on and on, but yes, lovely is Yes. 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 Uh, is a set that's going to be the physicists or the data scientists and the computers. Um, we've got somebody who doesn't have that background. Do we have to regard the digital use 
so that you get the output, but uh, you don't need to pay. Yeah, yeah, in most cases. So, uh, but for somebody at this, I don't know, are you going to say something? Uh, yeah, so maybe my question was a little bit better. Uh, so, how do you see, like, uh, is there any kind of fact to take people who are kind of teachers or uh, the people who are to create on the end? Yeah, yeah, no, no, see, so, okay. Should teachers be looking at, like, it's, uh, it's a threat or what? Opportunity or threat? Yes. Both. See, let me respond to both of these. Very often it is said that technology will displace teachers. The answer is very simple. Technology does not displace any humans. It is humans who displace other humans. So first thing, remember, technology doesn't come that I will drive myself. You buy a self-driving car. Or you will induct technology in the classroom. Technology cannot just come, teachers get out. So teachers who know technology, and are adept at it, but drive away those teachers who don't know technology because all the people who want to run the show will want teachers who are ready for the future. So technology won't come and drive. It is the people who are the decision makers who want a better, more effective system will choose people who can do that. And such teachers who can be part of it will be there. And what we want to say, there's a significant need. So the difference is that teachers are asked to do so many mundane things which is actually not worthy of being a human being or a teacher. In fact, one of the reasons I left teaching, I used to teach in IIT Kanpur, and I left teaching, and many of my colleagues remember it. I said, I cannot be grading these physics 101 books for the rest 30 years of my life. And that is what you expect a teacher to do, to lead a very boring existence, teaching the same. At least in IIT, we would change the subject which we want to teach. And most other places, he's teaching the same thing, same question paper, same answer paper for so long. What we are saying, it will become more exciting. You, so this is one of the basic things. So teachers, and in fact, that's why I like to call it educators, because teaching has become a defiled term in this thing. And educ, and I, let me tell you the value. So I also grew up at times when teaching was not considered very important, very good. Research was, and that's why I first did my PhD, postdoc, etc. Before I came to teaching. But today it is very different. Today, and you may not believe me. But you will see this in five years. Educators, as I call them, will be the most important commodity or species on the planet. And the reason is that an expert can demonstrate the expertise. But a teacher makes an expert out of an ignorant person. When you entered IIT, you were a stem cell who had passed class 12. Then when you went to engineering, medical or architecture or something else, you transformed into a specific an engineer or an electrical engineer, an architect, etc. etc. In biology, this process is called cellular differentiation. All the original cells are called stem cells and you have differentiation. So this is what the educator does. Today we think of that curriculum etc. as important, but that is not important. In school, you transform a five-year-old to an 18-year adult. That is the whole process of transformation. You did some teaching in that time because of society requirements, but that's not the main product. The main product is the transformation of a five-year-old to an 18-year-old, the transformation of an 18-year-old to a 21-year-old, and no further transformation thereafter. I'm saying lifelong learning, really transforming a 40-year-old into a useful 45-year-old. And that's why education will become the most important. I also say this, and I'm saying this with all seriousness, it will not be easy to employ a teacher on a salary. I have said this in many of my sessions that if any of you are principals or owners, you can forget that you can employ people on a salary. And uh, some of you are old enough to recall that people like Ashok Kumar, Devanan, all worked on salary in certain studios. Today you can't even employ Siddharth Malhotra on a salary. <laughs> forget anybody else. Varun Dhabat about Badi Chija. Tata Mangeshkar signed for a salary. Today, nobody. Shraddha Kapoor bhi salary ke liye nahi So the point is completely different. Today, there's a huge potential that people have. And this mobile phone has given you that reach. There are teachers already who are making millions of dollars a year without being employed. Because nobody can dare employ them. Right? I mean, he has agreed to be employed by whatever that employer is. But potentially, he's unemployable. It is, he's kindly given his consent <laughs> to act as an employee for a while. No, no, I'm, there is absolutely no doubt about that. So the, the
teachers have a great future, but not all teachers. So just being a teacher will not make you a teacher. If you are fulfilling the role of a teacher, of transforming an ignorant to a knowledgeable person. I also was saying this recently to one of the educators. I saw some advertisements on TV of Tanishka jewelers. And the key message that they were saying that our making charges are about the same as that of other jewelers. You know what are the making charges of jewelry? Percentage of the doesn't matter, but tell me some broad number. Uh, I had paid up to forty five percent. Good. So ten percent to forty five percent is the making charge of jewelry. What should be the making charge of a brilliant person who is becoming <laughs> somebody who you're creating for life? Huh? No. So you put it into money rounds. You say, you tell me how much your son will be in 25 years. Or he will not be my son, then he will be good for nothing. Now, if he is going to be a good for something, I only want 10% of that. Right? I said this once. I was once in, uh, when I was active, I was in a meeting with four junior, uh, joint secretaries of various ministries. Who are trying to say, "Ham IIT banana mein itna khach karte hain, ye karte hain, wo karte hain." Apne ka hold on. IITians ne kitna income tax diya, ye kabi calculate kiya apne. Apne ka isse badiya investment kuch hai hi nahi. Apne 200-300 crore khach karke IIT banaye, and ye saare log white mein paisa paate hain. To ek taraf calculate kariye, unhone mene kaha, "Mere ko ye power de do ki har ek ko jo main padhau, usse 10% of his earnings for life le sakun. Ab to 30% le rahe ho." So the point is, teachers will be valuable when they show their value. I emphasize this. So I say this very often for the MBA program and management. So when we grew up, there was no such field as management. There was no such thing. The only where I tell this, especially to teach the MBAs, the only place where we saw the word manager written was in cinema halls outside the box office. The house full of that, so managers are two extra ticket letters. अगर तो मैं याद होगा निरंजन सिनेमा ये सिनेमा सिनेमा में लिखा रहता था मैनेजर और लाइफ दूसरा दिखता था बैंक का कि बैंक मैनेजर एक कमरे में बैठा हुआ इसके अलावा दुनिया में कहीं कोई मैनेजर नहीं दिखता था लोग काम कर रहे सो व्हेन दिस मैनेजमेंट बिकम रिस्पेक्टेबल ही द ओनर ऑफ द मैनेजर आपने अगर कोई लाभा का बिजनेस देखा हो ही डिसाइड्स एवरीथिंग व्हेन पीपल रियलाइज दैट आल्सो दे वर इन्वेस्ट इन क्रिएटिंग द बिजनेस द रनिंग ऑफ द बिजनेस इज बेटर देन बाय प्रोफेशनल मैनेजर्स then the value of the management became important, the CEO became important, etc. because he was contributing. So when the visible <coughs> contribution of the manager became more important than the invisible market trends, Joe Adam Smith kata tha, then management became important. When the visible contribution of the teacher will become manifest. Jo aad tuition market mein hai, phalane sar ke paas tuition ke liye sab jate hain, because his visible contribution is known to people. When that becomes clear, and to some extent, Today it is an institution, that IIT to go to IIM will be better. But this will move on to individuals, because Anupam Kaushik is trying to learn branding and marketing. So as an individual you will be known, so people will go to you. It used to be earlier, when we were in that state, you went to a research institute following a professor, not the institute. So I went to Rurki, which was not known for physics at all. Because Professor S.K. Joshi had joined Rurki as a professor of physics. And many people have done that. They follow a professor from wherever they go. So individual teachers will become hugely, I mean, they will be like cinema star and celebrities that they will do. Because they can have an impact at a very large distance for a longer time. And they are affecting your mind. So, cinema and movies is about titillation. You are excited for an hour, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, you pay 500 rupees. If you transform for life, what making charges will you give? Yes. Like two points were uh, kind of raised. I wanted to share. Huh, I have points. still to respond to Lavi's thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 a mask will actually be left behind. And not that they will be followed up. And the people who will kind of turn them from teacher to teacher primer, they will be left behind. And the people who will kind of turn them from teacher to teacher primer, 
will, will actually be those people that you're talking about. And and rest of the people will and you know, you know, the, the more it is going to be like the being mentor to people. Yes. It's it's like personal relation, how you can connect. The the knowledge delivery is anyways happening through technology. So I'm not like my videos are there, you can watch my course. That's done. But if you want that so that the cost or the price of that personal time is going to be very, very high. Yes. Because because no. I can now reach out like Drona Chari would never reach out to more than hundred people, but I can reach out to hundred million people. Yes. That is the future of yes. Yes. Sure. I will do one more elaboration, but let me go back to what Lundi said. So Lundi, you seem to be worried that you are technically your own field in the world. It's no need. Now, now, the future is about the future. Yes. Now, 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 I will see. I come with that attitude. Uh, what can I buy on Monday? Yeah. So that's where I, you know, so I right. so, so on Monday. So, right. okay. okay. so on Monday, you will spread this message about what the future is about and get ready for it. And with concrete solutions. So now if you look at one of the same questions. The key benefit of AI is a better prediction at lower cost for a larger number of complex issues. And therefore, everybody needs to know about it. How do you work is the next level. And you can always get an expert to pick in and explain what that is and have to do everything yourself. So you can have various things of the same, but clearly there are two different things. This applies across things. So for example, you heard of this uh, thing called friends, the series of friends. Now the feature scripts have been written by machine learning. You see what the pattern is? So anything where you can see a pattern and you want to create minor deviations on that pattern, still keep it restricted to that, can be done by machine learning. And therefore you need to know a little more if you want to be able to do that. But it is usable here and now and it is already being used. So we are not talking in 1956 that AI will do this. Today, everywhere, there are applications and what people need to do is to identify where they would want improvement. So one of the standard methods is what are their points of pain? What are their points of inefficiencies? Where are they spending more than they would like to? And in each of this, you will find a corresponding solution. You want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say something really, uh, out of my experience. That there are hundreds of teaching aids given in YouTube videos. Yeah. And students can look up themselves. Yeah. But then, uh, when we, it's not in the teaching aid the magic is there. It's the way we interact with the students. So if we can excite them and make their life easier, that's where I'm able so, to so, use AI programs. So, so, so it's even pre-AI. I was once asked to give advice for some school in Michigan who had bought all these things which were called gizmos for teaching physics. And then the question was how do we get the students to watch those gizmos? So that is one of the important points. How do we get that behavioral change? We today think that is a human teacher which is the greatest motivator. But that is not right. AI will become a greater motivator because it will be data driven. You see the problem with a lot of people who are into teaching they have no idea how teaching happens. But there's a whole science about how learning happens. And interestingly, nowhere, I know the BA curriculum, nowhere does people. So for example, one of the simplest things which you will appreciate is, when you tell people something which is very trivial or known for the nobody's interested, when you tell something which is too abstract and complex, like lovely saying something will happen 40 years later, they're again not interested. People are interested in the boundaries of what they know. So you have to continuously see at which point does this person get interest. Who has done this most? Social media. Facebook actually hired people to understand this. They have, there's a whole book on that uh, by uh, Neil Eyal and so on called Hooked. So how do you get people hooked to something? You get them to do something, trigger. The response, if it is very trivial, you take for granted, you will not even look at it. If it is so difficult that you can't do, you will again go back into frustration. If it is just at that time, which is called tantalizing or tantalus cup, 
that you got 95, but you want to get 97, you are interested. If without any effort you are getting 100, you are not interested. If so, what the technology allows you to do is to, as I said in personalization, find out exactly to what extent the person is interested. And this is what happens in gaming. In games, when you fail, you don't give up, provided the failure is said that you feel next time I can do it. And this is what is going to happen and therefore by today, this job is done by a motivating teacher. Tomorrow, the technology will do it because it can figure out what you enjoyed, what challenge you liked, what you disappeared from, and then what you should be doing, and just get that incremental threshold which you can take care with ease. Is there any other question remaining? Okay, I can go on and on and we'll continue to interact as a group on this, but you broadly understand the mission. The mission is to spread AI awareness, to identify what the AI tools are, identify in our context and very speaking we want to so I have actually now gone and taught class 11 students some of these things but I want to go lower and lower and see where and we don't have to teach them see the problem is that there is one set of people who are marketing who say give me two lakh seventy thousand over ten months and I will teach you and you will become data scientist but the point is of being able to do this and this is so what we'll do is we'll have a tea break now, and after that it is all Rajiv's show. Okay. So if Thank you. Are, we can delay the tea break by ten minutes. Huh, fine. We can set it up to a point. Yeah, fine. We come so we'll right, right. So we'll have a tea break in ten minutes. Till ten minutes, he will try to pump up.